Hello, and welcome to D&D Daily. My name is Sage. Today I'm going to be doing a deep dive into the Cleric Death Domain subclass. In this video, I will be discussing its features, its strengths, and its weaknesses, as well as giving you an example build at the end. Before getting started, I want to talk about how I personally evaluate a subclass. I like to find what kind of flavor only this subclass can pull off and really lean into it. This means sometimes I will say no to a more powerful feature that comes from the base class in order to enjoy the uniqueness of the subclass. And today, this is going to be one of those cases. So, without further ado, it's time for the Death Domain Cleric. Starting at level 1, we are going to get proficiency in martial weapons. We are going to get the False Life and the Ray of Sickness spells, as well as the Reaper feature. What Reaper does for us is it gives us a Necromancy cantrip, and when we cast a Necromancy cantrip that targets one enemy, as long as there's another enemy within 5 feet of them, it'll hit both enemies. Now, this doesn't continue stacking. It's not if there's a whole bunch of enemies grouped together, we hit all of them. It's maximum of two. Proficiency in martial weapons could have been a big deal, but there are some problems with it. The problem being that we only have medium armor. We don't have heavy armor to take advantage of a strength-based armor, meaning we're going to at least need a 14 in dexterity to have a decent armor class. Now, we also require having good ability scores in wisdom as well as Constitution. So it's just too much to ask to have good scores in Wisdom, Constitution, and Strength, and decent scores in Dexterity. So we have to make the sacrifice and drop our Strength to be a Dex Fighter instead. Meaning what Marshall's Weapons gives us is a Rapier. Now a Rapier does a D8 of damage as opposed to a D6 with a Short Sword. So at the end of the day, what this feature does for us, it gives us a plus one of damage in a melee strike. Not a whole bunch. A far bigger deal for us is the Reaper feature. Now, we are going to take Chill Touch. We already get the other Necromancy cantrips, and it's just the best one even if we didn't. Now, why it's so good is it has a range of 120 feet. So like the Arcana Domain Cleric, the Death Domain Cleric has the ability to stay twice as far than its other ranged cleric counterparts and still be able to do damage. On top of that, it has two unique debuffs to it. If it hits an undead creature, that undead creature is going to have disadvantage on all attacks until the end of its turn, which is a pretty huge deal against some undead enemies. On top of that, for all enemies, it's going to make it so they can't receive healing for this turn. That's another situationally huge deal. It's especially mean if you hit a downed enemy because now there's no way to get them up. They can't be healed, including that one hit point from Revivify. It has a D8 of damage, which is nice middle of the road, solid damage. And on top of that, it's an attack, which is something we don't have from our cleric cantrips. We all are always making people do saving throws. Well, now we can do an attack roll. Moving to our first level spells, we have False Life and we have Ray of Sickness. Now, False Life, I have heard, is really good. People have sung its praises. Personally, I'm not so certain. I think casting it on a Barbarian who's raging is decent before combat. That's, that's an extra, basically twice the amount of health. So long as we're fighting someone who's doing particular types of damage, that is. I'll be honest, I haven't played with it that much, haven't practiced it, but it seems underwhelming to me. But others have said differently, so take that with a grain of salt. As for Ray of Sickness, we're going to make a ranged spell attack, which is going to do some damage, and then they make a constitution saving throw. If they fail that constitution saving throw, then they're going to be poisoned, and they can repeat that constitution saving throw. That is a lot of points of failure. We could miss the attack, they could succeed on the saving throw, poison couldn't bother them, and then they, could su su and then they can succeed on the next saving throw. So, unreliable is a word that comes to mind for me for Ray of Sickness. Now, this is going to begin a theme for the Death Domain Cleric. Unreliable, constitution-based saves is going to be something we're going to be talking about a lot as we go through the spell list. However, if we're fighting someone who's very reliant on their attacks, like Marshall's, but has a low constitution, this can be really useful. So, monks, rogues, and archers are really good targets for this. People who are dexterity strikers, sneak attackers, people like that, can really get debuffed hard by Rave Sickness. So it has uses, they're just limited. At level two, we get our Channel Divinity Touch of Death. When we hit with a melee attack, we can spend our Channel Divinity to do five points of damage times twice our Cleric level. So at level three, it's going to be doing 
11 points of damage. Now this unfortunately has to compete with the fact that we can spend our channel divinity to get spell slots back. And more often than not, spell slots are just going to be better. However, it's kind of cool and kind of fun, so I would use it sometimes, but it's probably not the most effective thing we can be doing with our channel divinity. At level 3, we get our second level spells being blindness slash deafness and ray of enfeeblement. Now blindness slash deafness is most often just blindness because it's a much better uh, condition to give to your enemies than deafness usually is. And it's a powerful status against pretty much all enemies. Marshals get disadvantage on all their attacks and you have advantage on all your attacks against them. And a ton of spells can't be cast if you can't target someone, which you can't if you're blind. So it's really good across the spectrum. The catch is that the enemy gets to make a constitution saving throw and gets to repeat the constitution saving throw every turn. So it has the same issue as Ray of Sickness, except we don't have to first hit with an attack. Moving on to Ray of Enfeeblement, it is a two-hit spell. If it hits, the target has disadvantage on all attacks, and then at the end of their turn, they can now make a constitution saving throw to end that effect. So there's not initially a constitution saving throw, but after a turn, there is, and it's a far weaker debuff than blindness is. There is a niche where if we're targeting someone with a low AC and a high con modifier, it might make sense to cast this instead of blindness and deafness if we can really take advantage of that one turn of disadvantage attacks fairly niche, and there's probably going to be something different we can do more often. So again, that theme of constitution saving throws continues, and here we're running into an issue. Where one is good, the other one is usually good as well. So blindness and deafness is good in a lot of the situations where a ray of sickness is good. Same with ray of enfeeblement. We're having a lot of redundancy with our spells, and so far the standout is blindness slash deafness, though it still is an unreliable spell. So our spell list so far isn't bringing us what you'd hope from a spell list being versatility primarily. At 5th level we get Animate Dead, which is something all clerics get. However, later we're going to be the best clerics at the undead, but we're not there yet. We also get Vampiric Touch. I love Vampiric Touch. It's too bad it's not better. Vampiric Touch is pretty cool because you cast it on yourself and you can now attack enemies with a magic spell attack that does necrotic damage and then heals you for half that damage. Now a pretty sweet synergy, if we go back to level 2, we can spend our channel divinity, which does necrotic damage, when we hit with vampiric touch, and it does in fact increase our necrotic damage and therefore increases our healing. This spell would be so good, except we get spirit guardians at this level, and there's just no question that spirit guardians is far and away a better use of your third level spell for nearly all situations. It does more damage to more people more reliably, and it also debuffs rather than heal. So it's just way, way better. At level 6, we get Inescapable Destruction, which makes all of our necrotic damage ignore resistance. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and since we're using necrotic damage so often, it's a good offensive buff for us. However, you gotta keep in mind that we are a cleric, and we probably have a ton of Radiant options, so even if we were being resisted, switching over to Radiance would probably be just fine. So it might have less value because of that, but it does keep us in flavor, which I can appreciate. At level 7, we get Death Ward and Blight. Blight is the ultimate death to plant spell, which is too bad we're probably not fighting plants too often. Other than that, it can be a big chunk of damage. It does, however, target constitution saving throws, which is something we already do in mass. Death Ward can be cast by all clerics, but it's a pretty solid preemptive panic button that runs for eight hours, so we basically eh, have one extra life for eight hours. Pretty good spell. At eighth level, we either get Divine or Blessed Strikes. Considering we have cantrip features that sometimes hit multiple enemies, I think Blessed Strikes is what you gotta go with. It's just better. Though if you prefer necrotic damage and you're not willing to switch to that radiant BS, live your dream, stick to it, go in there and smack them in melee. Level nine brings Anti-Life Shell and Cloud Kill. So anti-life shell is pretty interesting because if we move close to an enemy, it ends. So it's the kind of spell that we keep our distance on, which is totally different than the rest of what Death Domain Cleric does. It's like Death Domain has two different identities. Part of the features are saying, hey, get in there and fight, and part of them are saying, hey, stay back and cast spells. But overall, anti-life shell is a great keep them off me spell, as long as your enemies are not undead or constructs and they only attack within five feet you're basically invincible to them. Moving to Cloud Kill, this sets up our Cloud Kill plus Zombies combo, and this is why I said we're the best necromancer that clerics have, 
because we can summon a bunch of zombies, have them tackle our enemies, and cast Cloud Kill on top of it. They choke to death via poison, and we, our zombies are immune to it. Now, this is another con save, but if they fail, it's half damage, so it's kind of better than the rest of what we have. At level 17, we're going to get Improved Reaper. Improved Reaper lets us use the same thing that Reaper does, meaning when we target a single enemy and they have an en another enemy right by them, we can target both. For any of our Necrotic Spells, level 1 through 5. This is pretty nice because I've been saying that we have inconsistent spells. This helps make all of those necromancy spells a little bit more consistent because two people are having to make the saves. So it does help our consistency overall, which is really good because we need it. Some honorable mentions here are Blight if you want to hit two people for just a chunk of damage, but for me the standout is Contagion. If you're fighting two enemies who are pressuring you, who are both melee combatants, you can touch one, as long as you hit, it goes to the other, you poison both of them, and they have to make multiple constitution saving throws to break out of the poison. So you debuff Marshall's hard with this, and at minimum it's going to last three turns, but likely more. And all you have to do is hit with an attack. It's far more reliable than what else we've been using. My final statement on Improved Reaper is that it's good, but because of the five foot limitation, it's not fantastic. So it kind of stays in this okay region. Moving into the build, I want to take the problem of Death Domain, being that they're half identified as melee and half identified as range, and make that a feature. I want to be able to swap from melee combat to ranged combat on a dime. And I think that's pretty cool. Now, in order to make this build work, I'm going to take a Dampier lineage, and I'm going to give myself the three plus ones to my stats. That way, if I do point by, I can get plus three to dex, plus three to constitution, and plus three to wisdom, and dump the rest of the stats. I'm going to use a shield, medium armor, and a rapier as the core of my equipment. In early levels, I'm going to be a striker, using spells like Inflict Wounds combined with my Channel Divinity to hit single enemies hard. On my off turns, I will probably just be using my rapier to get a bit of extra damage in. Once I hit level 5, I'll start mixing in Vampiric Touch. Now, I, I said that Vampiric Touch is worse than Spirit Guardians, and that's true. And I also said that if there's something only this class can do that's worse than what the main class can do, then I'm still going to do it. So I'm letting go of Spirit Guardians to use Vampiric Touch more often. It's not going to be as good, it's good, but it is going to be more flavorful. And I especially like the combination with my Channel Divinity to get extra healing. So now we are going to be acting like a heal tank. You hit us, we heal it off. That's the idea. Now we're going to need good constitution at this point, so taking Warcaster at level 4 is probably a good idea. Now not only are we going to be healing through Vampiric Touch, but we also are a Dampir and we can use our Bite Attack to get some extra healing, which I'll only do if our health is below half, because then we have advantage on the attack. Now that attack still counts as a weapon attack, so at level 8 when we're getting our Divine Strikes, that still counts for the extra damage, though it's not going to count for the extra healing we get. Now this playstyle is further improved by Death Ward, because we have one emergency button where we get hit to 1 HP, and since we're a healer, maybe they, they spent their last big spell to kill us, but hey, we have that 1 HP, and now we can heal up from there. Something pretty cool to keep us alive just a bit longer, and help us be that heal tank. Now at level 9, I would begin using my Animate Undead to start making plenty of zombies. I'm going to start switching to a ranged style here. At level 9, both of our new spells totally supplement a ranged playstyle, and as a Dampir, our Spider Climb also totally synergizes with a ranged playstyle. So what we can do from here is be defensive, whether that be through our Spider Climb or our Anti-Life Shell, which do have some redundancy, they're both keeping melee people off of us, but sometimes they might come together, but more often than not, you're trying to use Spider Climb unless you can't. We keep at a range of 120 feet using our cantrips as our base, and then we can also do things like the zombies dogpile them and we can cast Cloud Kill from afar and kill them from range. Pretty awesome. And I want to be able to switch from this range style to a melee style. So I'd start the combat out playing this range style, but if I was getting pressured, I would switch to my close combat style and begin casting things like Vampiric Touch again and become more tanky. So I like how Death Domain can switch between the two. I think it's pretty rad. When it comes to role-playing this type of build, I would focus on the mix between Cleric and, and a Dampir, and have somehow mix the vamp vampirism with my religious beliefs. Like maybe 
taking on vampirism is a sacrifice you make to your god because now you live eternally and so you can continue serving god forever and that could be kind of a cool thing to play with but that, that you know the sky's the limit that i just want to this is the type of thing that i just want to give you like a nudge of creativity but i want you guys to go wild there and tell me what you come up with and leave it in the comments below because i'm excited to hear it so what is the conclusion with that domain it certainly has its problems the constant targeting of constitution saving throws and its issue of identifying its playstyle could both be considered downsides. However, it is the best cleric necromancer, it is the best self-healing cleric, and it's not a lame-ass goody two-shoes, so that can be fun for roleplay. Now, what would you do with your death domain cleric? What would you do to make them even more unique or even better? Let me know in the comments down below. We are D&D Daily. We release new D&D content every single day. So if that's interesting to you, hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you tomorrow. Peace out.